Good morning. And welcome to this chilly first grand rounds of the spring semester um, and 2017. It's really my pleasure today to introduce one of our own, Michael Lucy. Uh, Dr. Lucy took his MB, BCH, BA, uh, undergraduate and uh, medical degrees from the University of Dublin. He stayed on in Dublin as an intern resident and registrar. He was a fellow in gastroenterology at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and then a fellow in liver disease at King's College in London. Um, he also received an MD, which is the equivalent of a PhD while uh, in Dublin. He then undertook a uh, fellowship in the United States at the University of Michigan, where he was recruited onto the faculty at first as an assistant and then as the tenured associate professor and medical director of the liver transplant program at the University of Michigan. He was then recruited to the University of Pennsylvania, where he uh, was promoted to a full professor before he was recruited at the University of Wisconsin, where he's uh, served as professor and chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology since 2001. He's also co-medical director of the Digestive Health uh, Center since 2014. Dr. Lucy has, has published broadly, I counted 97 articles, the first one being in his chosen uh, gastroenterological interest is maternal gastrin important in congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis was his first uh, academic article. He's also published 19 editorials, 23 reviews, and 46 uh, book chapters. He's received grant support from multiple sources throughout his career and has been an active educator, truly a triple threat uh, at the medical student, resident fellow, and CME levels. He's also been a very good citizen locally and nationally. He serves as editor-in-chief of the Clinical uh, liver disease, an electronic, journal, uh, an electronic journal of the American Association of the Study of Liver Diseases. He's on uh, other editorial boards. He has served as a volunteer actively in the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the American Society of Transplant Physicians. Along the way, he's earned a number of awards, including being elected fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland, and he's a fellow of the American Association of the Study of Liver Disease. He's received four teaching awards over the years, and most recently, I think the crown, the jewel in his crown of awards is the Jeff Grossman Professionalism Award received in 2016 from the Department of Medicine. Now, I counted many, many talks, including 22 international talks, so consistent with our outstanding faculty, um, Dr. Lucy is a national and international speaker on his area of expertise, and today he is going to give rounds entitled Alcoholic Liver Disease, A Tale of Two Maladies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Rick. Um, uh, it, you know, it's daunting to hear your life described in that fashion. So it did remind me of one of the talks I gave. I see uh, Luis Fernandez here. Uh, I gave a talk to the Colombian and Venezuelan Society of Hepatology uh, in a wonderful city, uh, Cartagena. And, but I had a rush of blood to the head just as I was arriving to give the talk. So I decided I would try to give the talk in Spanish. So the talk... The talk, it, it, had, it had elements of Samuel Beckett, where the silences are more important than what is being said. So, <laughs> so you don't have to worry, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to try this in Spanish today. But I want to talk to you a little bit about alcoholic liver disease because it's something that I have been involved with for many years, and it is an important source of work for us. Um, and I'm going to try to give you one insight that I've gained over the years, and that really it's two diseases we're dealing with. If I, if I leave, get you leaving here with that view, I will have succeeded. Now, uh, you saw a disclosure side, but this is my disclosure side. You know, so I thought I should start with Bacchus, uh, the god of wine, and uh, because we, uh, many of us anyway in this room, enjoy alcohol. This is not a diatribe against alcohol. 
But alcohol is uh, something for which I think uh, many of us have an ambivalent relationship. And if, you, if we go back here to, to Rubens, you can see even he saw the mixed blessings of alcohol by showing us with this satyr here, you can see he's showing us the diuretic effects of alcohol. So, so alcohol brings good and bad with it. And uh, this is a picture from William Hogarth from uh, 1751. And it shows another aspect. It's a, it's, it's a more harsh account of the unwanted effects of excess alcohol. And it comes from a time when gin had just been invented in Holland by adding botanicals to uh, um, distilled alcohol. And then it came across the English Channel to, to uh, England where it uh, uh, overtook the drinking trade. Uh, and was seen as a great social evil. And so Hogarth um, uh, uh, depicted this here in Gin Lane. And you can see this woman here, she's, she's uh, 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 partly, oh, sorry, partly undressed. She's allowing her child fall here into the gutter. There's a fight going on up here. There's, there's some sort of co confrontation going on here as well. So the idea was that gin produces really bad effects to society and indeed they brought in uh, a law to uh, limit gin uh, but it was also a, a political issue because on this side uh, we have Beer Street and look everybody is doing very well with alcohol, you know, this person is providing food and they're all happy and carousing um, because beer was the English drink and so this was to say, you know, what we drink is fine. It was this, it's the poor classes drinking uh, this nasty stuff from Holland. That's, so that shows another aspect of alcohol and our usage of it. It has to be seen in a social context. And how we react to it and how we think other people are reacting to it uh, is very much both social and political. The idea that drinking was not a... Uh, uh, a moral weakness, but was in fact an illness, uh, comes from Benjamin Rush, uh, one of the fathers of uh, this country and the father of American medicine. And he saw this as an illness related to the brain. And that notion, while it's still not fully fixed in the public's consciousness, has continued. And its most recent iteration is in the DSM-5, with, uh, with this uh, uh, the set of criteria to define alcohol use disorder. So first of all, there's a working with nomenclature, giving up the idea, the phrase alcoholism and uh, alcohol abuse, but seeing this as a continuum of effect from drinking adequately or socially or not harmfully through uh, a, a moderate severity and up to uh, a, a greater severity. And it affects, it has biological effects, medical effects, behavioral effects and social effects. So while this is a very useful way for uh, documenting how alcohol is affecting an individual patient in a clinical study, I find this very complicated in practice. And the distinction between um, alcohol addiction and alcohol abuse still works in my practice. But this is the latest way of trying to codify this issue of what is the harm of alcohol. Well, just to say a little bit about how harmful it is, it's the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And the cause, it causes death by many ways. Uh, cirrhosis, we know, but also accidents, domestic violence, several cancers, uh, other end organ uh, tissue damage, such as pancreatitis. So its, it is, it's social toll is huge. Um, it disproportionately affects younger persons so that the potential... Uh, number of years of life lost per each person dying is higher than for many of the other diseases that we're talking about, cardiovascular disease and stroke, for example. Um, so that 30 years of life lost per alcohol-associated death is what's the estimate. And then it has a huge non-lethal toll with uh, social breakdown, marital breakdown, drunk driving, work absences. When you look at the impact on the economy, work absence is probably the greatest impact. And it's calculated in trillions of dollars. And then alcoholic liver disease is a world health problem. And it accounts for around about half a million deaths worldwide in 2010. 
and half of all deaths due to cirrhosis. So when we're talking, you know, we're, we're uh, embarking on the uh, undergraduate teaching course and the hepatologists are always arguing to try to get some hepatology into that course. But we really should throw away half of it and just say, look, we just need to talk about alcoholic liver disease. You, you've covered half of the diseases that kill people if you just know about alcoholic liver disease. And it also is associated with liver cancer. So there is no doubt that, in my mind, that alcohol excess is a very serious problem. Now, along with trying to redefine the notion of an addiction to alcohol in alcohol use disorder, we also see some efforts at redefining the, uh, how we describe alcohol use. Um, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said, said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And so the words we use are important under these circumstances. And the words used by the doctors and other professionals working in areas of addiction are quite different from the ones we use in the area of liver disease or liver transplantation, for example. So in the addiction world, a slip is a temporary return to drinking, which is recognized by the patient as potentially harmful and leads that patient then to seek help and to, and to re uh, start a period of abstinence with the goal of maintaining abstinence. Whereas a relapse is a more sustained resumption of drinking and this is sometimes called a bender, a harmful drinking, um, uh, abusive drinking, addictive drinking. And so this distinction between relapse and slip is important if we're going to characterize uh, drinking in our patients. Are we going to recognize alcoholic liver disease and, uh, in our patients? Well, we often are not because we're often going to fail to see that alcohol is one of the problems. Uh, um, uh, this is a particularly a case for younger doctors, in my opinion, and I'm an old doctor, uh, so I can say that, I think. Uh, um, and it's, it's, it's summarized in uh, a line from a poem by the Irish uh, poet Patrick Kavna, who said, every old man I see reminds me of my father. And so one of the reasons I think why younger doctors have difficulty asking about alcohol use or other areas of medicine that might be covered by taboo is that they see their parents, they see old people they respect, they can't bring themselves to actually uh, cross that barrier and ask those questions. So the CAGE questionnaire, which is here, is a way of just doing that. It's just an, it's just an automatic way. You just include that quest set of questions. Uh, have you ever cut down your drinking? Have you ever felt ang uh, angry that people told you to cut down your drinking? Have you ever felt guilty that you're drinking? Have you ever had drinks in the morning? And there is a Wisconsin asterisk here because it, does it count if the Packers were playing? I, I, I don't actually know the right answer to that because the people who drew this up didn't include that, that variation. But two positive answers to the cage questions would, would indicate a person who's at risk. And from there, you need to then stop and take a proper history. The audit questionnaire is a more detailed tool. It takes in the, the cage questions, but it's a simple method developed by the WHO for screening excessive drinking and also it's a brief assessment. So the cage questions is not an assessment. If you're going to do something a little bit more comprehensive, audit would be better. Now, I said that alcohol use and its impact on society is a social issue. And that leads to the question of how can this be controlled? Um, the most obvious example of a social response to this was prohibition. And while prohibition has many background factors to it, um, believe it or not, it, it was associated with a reduction in deaths from cirrhosis. So if we just look at prohibition on the basis of did it succeed in reducing liver disease, well, while association isn't causation, it, 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 it certainly provides evidence that it did. Uh, with, but it created a huge number of other social problems which were, uh, in the um, eyes of many, worse. And it also caused deprived people of access to alcohol, which uh, in, in used moderation is of no harm. This is an interesting uh, graph from a British paper, uh, a, a, a review paper called Calling Time. And those of you who have been in England at the right hours of the day will know that Calling Time was when there were uh, uh, designated hours in public houses. Um, the publican would come down at uh, a quarter to 11 because he, uh, he or she would have to close up at 11 o'clock and would say, last gentlemen, last drinks gentlemen, or last orders please. And that was known as Calling Time. So they have 
title their paper Calling Time. But what it shows is that if you, uh, if you look at the uh, um, available income, uh, discretionary income, uh, and uh, the consumption of alcohol, um, as uh, or sorry, it looks, at, it looks at something else. It looks, it looks at the, 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 the price of alcohol, I should say. If you look at the price of alcohol, as it has fallen over the years, the consumption has risen. And the price of alcohol in many countries has fallen dramatically, uh, both of spirits and of beer and wine. And uh, uh, without going too far into conspiracy theory, uh, various populations have been targeted. So women are recognized as wine drinkers. And so that's why when you're leaving Whole Food or Century, you will find wine at the exit. Uh, because it also appears to be the case that women find it difficult to go to buy wine in wine stores. or in. Uh, so, but they can pick up a bottle on their way out. So that's a, that's a marketing model that's been recognized. Um, and cheap beer is good for uh, uh, underage drinkers and students. So uh, uh, that's a loss leader. Um, in, in Scotland, where there's a problem now with uh, excess drinking, there is a move by the Scottish Parliament to raise this price. And this is called the, the Minimum Pricing Unit, uh, MPU. And it's been resisted, uh, interestingly enough, in the European Court. I'm not sure how that's going to work out with Brexit. But it's being resisted by the brewers and by the distillers uh, uh, because they're, it's not being necessarily resisted by the publicans because the sales have changed. Half of all alcohol in Scotland is now being sold in supermarkets. So, so if you raise the price, you would reduce the consumption of alcohol. And you would reduce the consumption of alcohol by persons who are ad addictive drinkers because addictive drinkers tend to spend the available cash they have and so whether you consider that's appropriate social engineering is a different discussion, but it shows that this is something that is open to manipulation without going as far as prohibition. A common thing that I hear said is that he or she is an alcoholic. They will never stop. This is something often said at the Transplant Evaluation Committee because that's a place where this is discussed. So-and-so is presented and someone says, well, that person's never going to stop. And what is the evidence that people can or cannot stop? This is one of the reasons why Benjamin Rush's idea uh, is so novel, because we all know that there is a choice element in alcohol use disorder. You don't have to drink. Not many people are being dragged into uh, public houses having an NG tube passed and having the alcohol poured into them. That is, that's a rare phenomenon. People are walking in there and buying the stuff or going to the supermarket and buying it. So there is a choice. So where does choice and uh, um, uh, uh, compulsion, where, do, where are they mixed? Well, this is an interesting study. This is an interesting man here. He is George Valiant. He is uh, the... Dean of American Psychiatrists. And when he was in his early academic career in Harvard, he discovered this study called the Grant Study, which had been started in the 1940s. And it was a study to look for reasons why people became leaders. And because of the 1940s, they only looked at men, and they went to Harvard. So they had a, a number of biases already established that Harvard graduates would be leaders of the world. And so they took an intake class of Harvard and they interviewed them and they measured their arm span and various things. And they did have some leaders. Uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was one of them. And his results are closed. Uh, ben Bradley, any of you who uh, have seen all the president's men, Ben Bradley was the editor of the Washington Post and is in that movie, ca characterized in that movie. He um, ca opens his memoir with the day he went to the Grant study. So the Grant study was looking at uh, uh, these young men. And when Dr. Valiant found it, who was 20 years old and was run, had run out of funding and was going to be folded up, and he recognized that this was a resource that should be kept going. And through uh, funding mechanisms, the NIH and other places, he kept it going for 40 more years. And he then also added a second cohort, which he um, called the city cohort. Um, they were largely Irish-American uh, poor working class men in Boston. 
Now, the study was looking at all sorts of aspects of, uh, of social behavior, but he has abstracted from this those persons who are heavy drinkers and seen what has happened to them uh, in the two groups. And he's able to then publish this paper, which, if only for its title, is worth knowing, a 60-year follow-up. So this, is, this is shows you when you're not worried about tenure, you can do a study like this, you know, 60-year follow-up. Uh, and, and this is what he found. You know, so the numbers aren't large, but the length of observation is extraordinary. And uh, you can see that among uh, the, uh, the uh, by age 70, among the subjects who are ever diagnosed as having been dependent drinkers, you know, uh, uh, a majority are dead. Now they sh that's higher death rate than it should be for 70-year-old men. So alcoholism, alcohol use disorder, and its consequence kills people. Uh, but 21% sorry about that 21% in the college group and 32% in the city group had managed to uh, uh, establish abstinence so there's a different path for different people here and if they can get back to abstinence they can restore their life expectancy so long as they haven't accumulated some other bad effects and then there were some controlled drinkers here and he says this is a very rare phenomenon. He says controlled drinking is a rare and unstable event. So for the patients that we see, we never advocate this. They already have liver damage. So controlled drinking is a fanciful notion that we don't support. And then there's this group, which is quite interesting, a group that are continuing to abuse alcohol without ever reaching the severity stage. And they're the patients that our patients mention. I, my brother, my, my, my brother-in-law, somebody I know well, they drink just as much as I do, and they're not being affected. And that's one of the conundrums of, of alcohol use. Why is it that some people can continue drinking and not get these effects? He also found that abstinence was only secure after five years, which is an important piece of information for us in the transplant program, where we're looking at duration of abstinence as a predictor of future uh, behavior, and it's not much of a predictor. And then prior alcohol dependence, so that's, that in, 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 in addiction speak, that's hitting bottom. And alcohol, uh, AA attendance were the two best predictors of sustained abstinence. So you can form a notion that these people here, it never had to injured them badly enough for them to need to stop. And so, so alcohol abuse could persist for decades without remission, death, or progression. So now let's turn a little bit to alcoholic liver disease. So we, I've talked more about alcohol use disorder and this, this balance between volition and choice. And it, I should point out, I haven't going to present data here, that, that people have done studies on dizygotic and monozygotic twins raised together and raised apart. And it appears that it, approximately 50% of the risk of being an alcohol use disorder patient is inherited. So there's a strong inherited aspect to drinking too, too much. And then what makes it likely that that person who's drinking too much becomes a person with alcoholic liver disease? And here are some of the, some of the, the factors. Um, so one is dose. But dose is a, it's, it's a poor dose response curve because many people can drink very heavily and not, not get liver disease. But the more you drink, the more likely you're to get liver disease. Gender. Women are more likely to get alcoholic liver disease for the same amount of alcohol as men. This is a curious thing because we see fewer women with alcoholic liver disease. Uh, it's because fewer women drink to the degree that men do. And so they have uh, uh, changed the balance, but they are at greater risk. And then comorbid diseases, chronic hepatitis, and in the, pa in the recent past, chronic hepatitis C has been the biggest driver we have seen. And now with treatment for chronic hepatitis C, that perhaps is going to drop out of the, of the list. Hemochromatosis alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. NASH is an interesting one, non-alcoholic steel hepatitis. We see a lot of morbidly obese patients here with diabetes, uh, uh, high blood pressure, hyperlipidemia, who are also drinking excessively. There has been some, a, a certain amount of data to suggest that at modest alcohol use, alcohol may be protective from NASH. I think that's controversial, and certainly excess drinking is not protective. And then there's this question of inherited propensity. And this has now been clarified quite a lot in recent years through genome-wide association studies. 
And one particular uh, polymorphism in this gene called PNPLA3 has been shown to be highly associated with the progression from alcohol excess to alcohol liver disease. It's also highly associated with uh, um, metabolic syndrome, uh, uh, abdominal fat, and transition to uh, uh, fibrosis in the liver. And it's, it's a gene that's related to the uh, uh, um, disposition of triglyceride in, in hepatocytes. Um, uh, it's a patatin uh, is a protein, which is a protein in potatoes, believe it or not. Um, and so this gene has now been widely shown across different uh, um, uh, ethnic groups to be the m most significant genetic uh, r relation to the development of alcoholic liver disease. And then there are two other genes that have also emerged uh, uh, with less strength, but also uh, uh, greater than, than expected. And then there's the question of protective factors. Uh, well, the most obvious protective factor is not drinking. And so if you live in a country where alcohol is not readily available, if you live in a society where alcohol is disapproved of, you're much less likely to get alcoholic liver disease. Uh, uh, but outside that, um, the next best protective factor is coffee. And so there's a lot of data to show that coffee is protective against fibrotic liver disease, alcoholic liver disease included. Um, and it's, it's cheap coffee is better. I, I'm not trying to do anything <laughs> to damage... The, 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 the business is EVP, which I uh, dearly love, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's brewed coffee that is, that, 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 that is most protective. Six cups a day. <laughs> yeah. So what about, how, is, how does alcoholic liver disease come about? So there's a lot of issues of nomenclature here. So one of them has recently been sorted out quite nicely by a, by a, by a committee. And that is to say that alcoholic steatohepatitis as a term relates to appearances on biopsy. So we now restrict that term, alcoholic steatohepatitis, to what you can see when you biopsy somebody. And so alcoholic steatohepatitis is a common feature in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, which is a clinical syndrome. So, and what causes alcoholic steatohepatitis? Well, it now appears to be a chronic, low-grade inflammatory condition and it's a similar process seems to be present in both ASH and NASH. And it's due to an imbalance between the gut microbiota, the mucosal barrier, and the innate immune system. And that's shown in this picture. So, and this, these data have largely come from animal experiments using uh, models in which uh, uh, rats and then mice are either fed out alcohol or ingenious methods whereby uh, alcohol is poured into their stomachs and they're kept in a sort of harness. Those models have problems in that they produce an inflammatory response and they produce fat. They tend not to produce fibrosis. Nevertheless, they have led to this, this model in that uh, you get a bacterial overgrowth in alcohol, persons who are chronically ex, uh, uh, ingesting excess alcohol with translocation of gram-negative bacteria and uh, uh, often summarized as LPS, lipopolysaccharide. There's also ingress of breakdown products of just uh, of the, of, of the, the cell wall, etc. And, and these then tr migrate up the portal tract into the liver here they are in the sinusoid, and they're met by the Kupfer cell. Uh, who, the Kupfer cell is playing for Ireland here. It's wearing green. And uh, the, 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 this is the receptor for lipopolysaccharide, uh, the TL or toll-like receptor 4. And this triggers then uh, an intracellular cascade leading to the uh, elaboration of cytokines. And the cytokine that has been most uh, um, implicated is TNF-alpha, while at the same time, uh, uh, reactive oxygen species are produced. And this model has been important because it has led to people to try to uh, uh, um, interrogate this and abrogate it by uh, interfering with reactive oxygen species, giving uh, antioxidant mixtures, vitamin E, etc., and giving anti-TNF models. And they have largely been a failure, but that the model still remains. So, uh, so this is linking in the, the gut microbiota mucosal barrier translocation and the activation of the innate immune system in a chronic inflammatory pro model of chronic alcohol-induced injury. The injury of most importance to us 
is probably the activation of the stellate cell, which uh, was previously called the ETO cell or fat storing cell. And it's a cell in, uh, uh, in the liver that uh, produces collagen. And it's a myofibroblast. And it, ha it either is initiated, in, and then once it's initiated to be active, is, uh, uh, there's a perpetuation phase. And this model, again, is one that is open to treatment, uh, either trying to prevent the initiation or to uh, 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 prevent fibrogenesis or enhance uh, degradation or uh, uh, in, uh, induce apoptosis. So, so the, 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 there's a model here that we could also try to, to, to interact with. So at the moment, alcoholic liver disease has many potential treatments. And this is the standard medical student side of what we consider to be alcoholic liver disease. So we have steatosis, and then alcoholic steatohepatitis, as I mentioned, and that's shown in this picture here with neutrophils, Mallory's hyaline, which is break, just, just uh, 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 trash, really, in the, in, uh, accumulating in, in, in the hepatocyte, and ballooned hepatocytes. And then fibrosis, which is shown in this mass on trichrome stain, the blue. Now, there's two or three things to say about this. First of all, all three can exist in the same biopsy. The idea that there's a, a, a steady pathway from one to another is an interesting notion, but in practice, of the patients we see with a clinical syndrome of alcoholic hepatitis, whom we biopsy and find steatohepatitis, 90% uh, of them will also have cirrhosis at the time we biopsy them. Uh, the other thing to say is that in the past, steatosis was considered to be a benign condition. There's a famous uh, experiment done by Charles Lieber with uh, medical students where he biopsied their livers, then fed them alcohol and biopsied them again. Yeah. So, it's a day before IRB. Uh, <laughs> and he was able to show that they could get, al they could get uh, uh, um, uh, f fat uh, with a few, a few weeks drinking. And then he was able to show again that the fat went away. So, so, so the, it was thought that steatosis was sort of a benign event that was associated with alcohol use. But it's not benign. For many patients, it stays harmless. But for those patients with the right genetic background, uh, they will then progress to inflammatory injury and, uh, and cirrhosis. Our difficulty is telling who is who. So this is the model that I'm mentioning. That you, so you drinking to excess, and then some patients can drink to excess and keep normal livers, but the majority, if they drink enough, will get steatosis. And that then can lead to steatohepatitis. And whether you have to get steatohepatitis to get fibrosis is not certain. Uh, that's why the, the, this line here is, is, is interrupted, whether you can go back from fibrosis to steatosis or whether you can go directly to fibrosis. That's unclear. And then some patients get hepatocellular carcinoma. And what happens to these patients when we see them, when you see them in, as inpatients? Well, that's shown well in this very elegant study from Denmark, where um, they just looked at uh, 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 an intact catchment area. It's the sort of thing that can be done in Scandinavia when they have such wonderful records. And they had 466 patients with alcoholic cirrhosis, and they just looked at what happened to them over this interval, 93 to 05, and just showed that once they developed um, hepatic encephalopathy, for example, their, their survival was markedly reduced, you know, so, so that over 50% of them are dead within a year from, from the first time they get encephalopathy. Uh, 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 this line here is ascites and bleeding. Again, high mortality. Even those who have no complication, they have a high death rate. As I said, there's more than one way to die from alcohol than liver disease. So you can see from these patients with alcoholic cirrhosis, this is a very bad disease. And we see all these complications of liver disease. What can be done? Well, the first thing they can do, patients can do is stop drinking. And if patients do stop drinking, they can have remarkable recovery. And any of those of you in the audience who have looked after patients with alcoholic liver disease with a bilirubin of 25 and that patient then can stop. If you've seen that patient a year later, their bilirubin could easily be one. The difficulty is stopping drinking, and stopping and staying stopped. Um, 
This is an ancient study, but it's famous because, it, because of what it showed, done by one of the fathers of American hepatology, Gerald Klatskin, uh, from Yale. And it just compared the outcome of patients from the onset, from the diagnosis of alcoholic cirrhosis or the diagnosis of cirrhosis with decompensation in those who claimed to be abstinent and those who claimed not to be. Now, the study has been criticized because it's probable that some of these patients claiming to be abstinent weren't completely abstinent. But it's very likely there was a qualitative difference in the amount consumed between the two groups. And while the mortality remains high in the, in the abstinent group, it was much worse in the continuing to drink group. So for our patients with alcoholic liver disease, we can be unequivocal in our advice. Our advice is the best thing to do is to stop drinking. And yet we shouldn't ignore all we've learned from the addiction specialists, that this is a disorder of relapse and remission. So we need to recognize that that patients will drink again, even those who have had serious complications. And so how do we uh, uh, um, balance uh, the, um, the ideal with the, with the uh, expected? Well, one thing to do is we can try to find out whether patients are drinking. And this comes back to my uh, quotation from Patrick Kavanagh. The most simple way to monitor whether a person is drinking is to ask them. And you'd be surprised how often patients are not asked when they come to clinic. And this really applies not just in the liver clinic. It really applies in primary care clinics, but also in things like orthopedic clinics, uh, um, uh, the emergency room, urgent care. So a person who presents with um, a, a sore throat, that person may also be uh, drinking to excess. Um, but the simple, sim these are, these are, once you know there's a problem, the cage questions is a screening question. Once you know the problem, here are some questions you can ask. On an average day, uh, on average, how many days per week do you drink alcohol? On a typical day when you drink, how many drinks do you have? What is the maximum number of drinks you had at any given occasion during the past month? And if you're looking for guidelines of what it should be, um, the, the, they're dropping all the time, by the way. But the current guideline is that women should not drink more than one drink a day, and men should not drink more than two drinks a day, and nobody should drink more than four drinks at a time. So it's after, it's after Christmas and the New Year. I hope it's not too much of a, a, a dampener. <laughs> So what about trying to treat patients to control their drinking? And here is a list of drugs that have been used in some study to try to control drinking. And I would point out that there's only one, baclofen, that has been studied in patients with cirrhosis. All the others have not been studied in patients with cirrhosis. And several of them have reasons not to be used in patients with cirrhosis. So disulfiram, or antibuse, in Dublin used to be called antibuse, Anyway, a, a disulfiram, it, it, causes, it causes fulminant hepatic failure. We've had a case of that in the last 24 months here. So it's, it's a potentially dangerous drug. Naltrexone has a black box warning about liver injury. Uh, it can proceed, which I see used quite a lot, it has never been studied in cirrhosis. And the evidence that it works is, is questionable. Um, uh, and you can go, to, go down the list. So uh, there is no established drug for trying to control craving. But the best candidate at the moment is baclofen. And let me just show you a little bit about it, because it's just one study. It's a study in the Lancet. Uh, uh, um, when I was in London, we used to call Lancet Acta Attracta. So they like papers that had a sort of a jazzy observation. And this, this is one of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, a study uh, of severe alcohol-dependent pa patients with liver cirrhosis. Uh, and this is how it worked. So they screened 148, they randomized 84, so they had 42 and 42, and it was a 12-weeks treatment, six months observation. Uh, but they declared that abstinence was what they were looking for. And then if you look down here, the number of patients who maintained abstinence was significantly higher in the baclofen group after 12-weeks treatment. So baclofen is a, a, an agent that can be considered. It hasn't been studied well enough, really, but it can be. Its, its main side effect is sleepiness. So many of our cirrhotic patients can't sleep anyway, so you could give the baclofen uh, before they go to bed. What about treating alcoholic hepatitis? And here the, the table is also littered with drugs. 
And I used to have a slide when I was giving a lecture to uh, the uh, uh, GI Path of Phys course, which was a picture of uh, a Chekhov and a quote from one of his plays, which says, one of the doctors in his place says, where, um, where there are many treatments, there is no cure. And I then asked the group, um, why should we be interested in Chekhov? And somebody said, because he's an alcoholic. And I said, no, because he's a doctor. And so, so <laughs> it was an interesting little uh, m mind exercise. You know. uh, but Chekhov was a doctor as well as a great writer. And uh, he recognized that where there are many treatments, uh, there is no cure. And that applies here as well. So let's just look at one or two of these. Um, I'm going to just talk about uh, prednisone and pentoxyphylline. Uh, there, there are relatively decent data for N-acetylcysteine as well. Antioxidants have failed to work um, so far, probably because of the redundancy in the system. They just aren't strong enough in a, uh, in a targeted fashion. Anti-TNF biologics have now been withdrawn. There have been two trials, and they both have had to be stopped early by the data safety monitoring boards because of excessive infections. So this shows you the danger here. We're dealing with quite fragile patients and using very strong medicines may have unwanted effects. There is a study out of, out of India so, uh, supporting GCSF um, and I think we'll have to wait and see. It's a difficult drug to use in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis since many of them already have a marked leukocytosis before you start. So. I'm not sure where that's going. But just let's look at pred pred prednisone or prednisolone and pentoxyphylline. So these are the data that really support prednisolone. And they are, it, it's a reworking of a meta-analysis of four trials. Some of them are quite ancient, but they got good numbers. All of the patients had severe disease. And that is, for those of you who are familiar with the MADRI discriminant function, all had a discriminant function of greater than 32. So you can just say that they all were severely jaundiced and had an elevated INR. And in the patients given uh, corticosteroids, their survival was nearly 80%. And the patients who were given uh, no corticosteroids, it was 66%. And that's at 28 days. So even the best patients had a 20% 28-day mortality, and the untreated patients had a 35% untreat, uh, uh, untreated mortality. Now, this is a study called the STOPAT trial, and it's worth spending just a moment on it because it has really created challenges to us. It's done in Great Britain. Um, it's got 1,100 patients, so there's no other study like this. Um, they, uh, all patients had to, have, uh, had to meet um, a cr criteria for drinking, um, they uh, excluded patients with jaundice from longer than three months or hadn't been drinking for two months. But perhaps a critical thing was that they made the diagnosis on a clinical basis. They had to have a discriminant function of 32, but they did not have to have a biopsy. So one of the questions is whether they had corrupted their population with patients who didn't actually have severe alcoholic hepatitis but had other forms of liver disease and alcohol as well. Uh, and you can see the alcohol use in these groups was high. And the primary endpoint was 28-day was mortality because that's the primary endpoint here. So they were really trying to study this issue in a similar fashion. Although in, this, in these studies, all of the diagnoses were made with liver biopsy control. And here what they found, they had a placebo-placebo group, and they had 17% 28-day mortality. So they actually got half the mortality that they anticipated in the untreated group. So their power analysis was already off. And so why this mortality is low is unclear. Is it a selection thing? Is it we've improved treatment for dialyzing these patients? Uh, that's, uh, is it uh, uh, they had the wrong, some wrong patients in the group? It's unclear. I can say that we have been part of a multicenter study of alcoholic hepatitis here, again with similar criteria, and we are seeing a 28-day mortality of 30% in the patients that we have recruited to our study. So nevertheless, the prednisone and placebo group, the prednisone and pentoxyphylline group, and the pentoxyphylline group, none of them came out as being substantially better than the, the non-treated group. When they then did um, a regression analysis, prednisone came out as significantly better. This is a post hoc analysis, however. So whether you take this analysis and say, prednisolone still is a 40% benefit, 
or you say this is the analysis that you intended and it didn't show benefit is unclear. But it has thrown the use of prednisone into, into question. Nevertheless, I'm going to suggest this option to you as a, as a plan for these patients. That if you have a patient with suspected alcohol-related hepatitis, that you seek and treat infections and other complications, and then you calculate the mad madri discriminant function. If it's high, consider a biopsy if you're still in doubt about the diagnosis. So if you're not sure that this is really alcoholic hepatitis, look for steatohepatitis hepatitis on the biopsy. And then start prednisolones. And then at day seven, calculate this thing called the Leal score. And the Leal score is a simple calculation done on, done on a computer, but essentially is looking for a drop in bilirubin. If the bilirubin hasn't dropped, the drug hasn't worked. If it hasn't worked, you can stop the prednisolone, but you're left with almost nothing else to do. It's consider investigative treatment and a consultation to palliative care. I mean, that's really where this is. This, these patients have a high mortality at this, at this arm. Not absolute mortality, because there still is a small proportion. If they stay off alcohol, they will, will survive. But they have a high mortality. And then if the Leal score shows that this is working, continue it for 28 days. And after then, the patient has to continue to abstain. And that really is the crucial thing for six-month mortality, is that they continue to abstain from alcohol. In the last five minutes, I just want to talk about liver transplantation and start again with a historical note. This is going back to 1984, and this was the NIH uh, consensus conference on liver transplantation, which declared that liver transplantation was a standard therapy and not an experiment. That was very important in the development of liver transplantation in the United States because insurance companies then paid for it. And many programs started immediately after this, including the one here, this our program. But this I took from the discussion of transplantation of patients with alcoholic liver disease. It said, not many patients with alcoholic liver disease will stop ethanol abuse so as to qualify for transplant. And the timing of the procedure in general can be identified, but in individual patients will be difficult to establish. A larger experience is needed. So a very hesitant assessment about alcoholic liver disease and liver transplantation. Now, this is what has happened. Now, I drew up these data in 2010 for a paper I was writing. Uh, it, got, it went through many, many iterations, this paper. I recruited help from the fine house staff of the University of Wisconsin. Kim Daniel helped me with it. We rewrote the paper. It got some of the most excoriating reviews I've ever had. But I can, uh, I've just got it accepted. It's, uh, it's like getting a child that was living in your basement off to college. You know? <laughs> so these data come from that paper. Um, but you can see that in this first 100,000 primary transplants, uh, a considerable number of patients with alcoholic liver disease were transplanted. So that initial uh, the consideration that patients with alcoholic liver disease wouldn't be chosen proved to be false. But still, they go through a particular selection process, and this is why. So there's a dynamic to liver transplantation. There's the availability of the organ, the definition of success, and the patient need. But where liver transplantation is involved, organ availability, there's a fear that if we transplant many alcoholics, we will lose public support. And then there is the definition of success. Is it a success if the patient is alive but they still drink? And finally, there's personal responsibility. How deserving, to use a word in quotes, are patients with alcoholic liver disease? Are they not responsible for their own problems? Or do we take Benjamin Rush's view that this is a medical problem and take the view that this is a, that is a genetic problem with social implications and social imp impact. So liver transplant patients go through a more rigorous assessment when they have alcoholic liver disease than other patients. And the pur purpose is to try to determine whether they will return to drinking, even though we still remain somewhat ambivalent about what the meaning of that drinking is. Um, because if, actually, if, actually if I go back here, just to this slide, because alcohol relapse, while it leads to non-adherence and accelerated allograft fibrosis, the reduced survival is only long-term. You see that at five to 10 years. So saying we're going to withhold a life-saving operation for somebody who's going to die in the next six months because they're likely to damage the graft over 10 years, that's an interesting philosophical and ethical question. This has got us to the six-month rule. 
which is that we want patients to have a declared abstinence of six months. And I've already pointed out that in the world of addiction, six months doesn't mean very much. And true enough, um, it is only associated with a modest reduction in subsequent use of alcohol after transplantation, particularly if you define any use rather than a slip versus a relapse. And but however, it's simple to apply. Have they six months? Have they not? Thumbs up, thumbs down. That's the, and that, that is uh, one of the attractions of it because we worry over, it, over this issue if we don't have something, something rigid. However, it admits patients who will relapse and it excludes patients who will not relapse. So two pieces of data from, from here. This is a study that um, we did last year. It's looking for a home. Uh, um, Ahmed Akhtar and Rita uh, German and uh, uh, Jason Eccleston were all involved in doing this. So we just we contacted uh, programs around the country and asked them about addictions. But this is just the part about abstinence. Do you require abstinence uh, for six months? And you can see that the majority do. But there are a considerable number of programs which say we make the, we make the judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. So there is no consistency between centers. So where you go, where your insurance company sends you, where you live, radically de affects whether you're likely to get offered a liver transplant or not. So what do we try to do here? Well, we try to make a nuanced assessment based on psychosocial judgment, uh, relying on our addiction counselors and uh, social workers. And there are four elements that they're looking for. Has the person insight into their addiction? Are they integrated in society and have support, or are they isolated? Have they tried to stop in the past? And believe it or not, many failed attempts in the past is worse than never having failed in the past. And finally, psychiatric comorbidity, particularly polysubstance abuse or, uh, or, or character disorders, make it very difficult for patients to establish uh, sobriety. So we take this in, and then we make a judgment about it. And this is what happens. So these are data that, that uh, John Rice has put together. And so this is a review of the program here. And you can see that we have patients who have less than six months sobriety and more than six months sobriety. And we accept some from each group. So even having six months sobriety doesn't necessarily mean you get approved. So going to this nuanced model doesn't protect you from making a hard decision and in some way makes a harder decision. Finally, I just want to talk about severe alcoholic hepatitis. And this is the paper that caused all the trouble. This is from France and one center in Belgium. And they did a pilot study of 26 persons who had been treated with prednisolone, had the Leal score at seven days and failed. And so they, were, they then uh, went through a careful assessment of their psychosocial um, uh, suitability. They had to be the first episode of, uh, of, um, of alcoholic hepatitis. No prior attempts at rehabilitation. And they separated out the doctors, the social worker, the team on the floor, uh, uh, and said each of them has to decide separately and they all have to agree. And so they had 26. And the survival in the 26 was far better than 26 historical controls. And indeed, it's probable that they can improve this survival. Their main source of death was fungal infection. So the same group have now done a study of 100 patients uh, where they're giving prophylactic antifungals. Uh, that data won't be ready for a, a year. So just to say what happens... Uh, so we now face with these patients very severe illness whom we think we could save their life. And what do we do? And we're not sure what to do, to tell you the truth. We're doing the best we can. Um, they are likely to drink again. These are data also from here using a biomarker for alcohol called phosphatidylethanol and looking at post-transplant patients in our program, both ones who are controls, uh, non-alcoholic patients, and patients with a history of past alcoholic dependence. And you can see that we get positives in the alcoholic patients, even, and they all say no, or many of them say no. They know they shouldn't say yes. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's um, not sensible to admit it unless you're going to, you're, you're, you've, you understand what the consequences are. And patients are highly afraid that they're going to damage their circumstances if they admit to drinking. 
It's interesting that some of the non-alcoholic patients who are under no particular reason not to be drinking also are drinking but are not, uh, not admitting it. So there is it's, the, 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 the conspiracy of silence is, is an interesting element here. But patients will, some patients will drink. And the best estimate is that if you look at abuse of drinking, and even among studies where people have been selected according to the six-month rule, that, uh, that, that uh, six, uh, 20 percent of those patients w might, might drink at some point post-transplant. And does it harm them? Well, yes, it does. So this side just lists out all the things you saw on the earlier slides about the damaging effect of alcohol. So this comes to my final point. It is two maladies. It's the malady of alcohol use disorder and the consequences in the liver. And to actually try to address one, you need to address both. And we need to try to get to a point of understanding what addiction is and how it affects people and work through that. Um, so that's, that's a sort of aspirational end. You know, we're going to try to do better. But what about a more simple end? Couldn't we just fix it? And there's a scene in A Night at the Opera, with the, which is the Marx Brothers, where Groucho Marx says that, uh, that, that he has um, uh, uh, filled cannelloni with bicarbonate and caused and cured indigestion at the same time. I don't know if any of you have seen that. It's in the, they're, in, they're, in, they're at the opera. Um, well, you can do the same with alcohol here. Uh, which I'll show you in a, well, in, in a second. Just before I come to that, to summarize, this is, this is what um, I'm trying to, trying to portray today, is alcohol use is in, impacted by genetics and inheritance and by availability in the, in the environment and social mores. That leads to the total dose. And then if you're the person who, in whom that dose is going to be harmful, through genetics or gender or comorbid uh, uh, conditions, you're then likely to get alcoholic liver disease. So this is why it's a tale of two maladies. What about trying to cause and cure it at the same time? That's why I want to give you the Irish coffee, which is, combines coffee <laughs> with, with, with Irish whiskey. And here are the data on the effect of coffee on, 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 uh, on cirrhosis. So, on that note, I'll finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. We have time for a couple of brief questions and brief answers. I'll ask you to call in the audience. Sure. Yes. I, uh, So the question is whether the animal model for alcoholic liver disease involving the microbiome has been looked between lean and fat mice. And I'm not aware of that, actually. Your, your point that, that leanness and fatness affects the microbiome is well taken. And the microbiome affects leanness and fatness. You can make thin mice fat by giving them fat mice uh, a, a fecal transplant. But I haven't seen data that have looked at that particular point related to alcohol use. Sure. Well, certainly it's well described that excess alcohol and uh, what was called morbid obesity ha is, has a greater risk of alcohol, uh, significant alcoholic liver injury than in lean persons who are drinking. That. We'll bring this grand rounds to a close. I want to thank Dr. Lucy. <laughs>